and they spent the entire time just interrogating all the other dudes in the room. They don't say anything to me and they don't say anything to her. And then with about five minutes left in the meeting, one of the architects said, don't you think that you should ask a question of the person who will decide if you get paid or not? And you could just see all of these guys in their beautiful, mm. freshly pressed blue suits like <laughs> sink into Just their wither. chairs. So mm-hmm. sad. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. This is Brave New Work, a podcast about reinventing our organizations and the search for a more adaptive and human way of working. I'm Aaron Dignan, and I'm joined as ever by my illustrious co-host, Rodney Evans. I feel like the adjectives get more generous by the week. Hello, That's, I'm just, yeah, I'm here to platform you. <laughs> um, <laughs> We are also joined by Kat Swatel, an engineering manager from Verica. Kat, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. On today's episode, we're going to talk about epistemic injustice, which Kat and I have both decided has not been the topic of that many other podcast episodes. So strap in, folks. But before we unpack that, we're going to do a check-in round. We are going to do a check-in round. And Kat gave us a good one, but I can't think of an answer, so we're skipping it, and you'll have to ask us if you want to know what it was. I run the check-in, so I only ask questions that I know answers to. Okay, so we will do this like we always do, and it will go Aaron, then Kat, then me, answering the following question. What is a fashion trend that you are very glad went away? Okay, good. So I grew up mostly in the 80s, so I have lots to choose from. And I'm going to say when I was in like late elementary school, early middle school, a lot of people, mostly girls, but also boys would wear multiple pairs of socks and then fold them down so you could see each of the multiple colors. And that just felt like, first of all, it made my feet really hot. I didn't care for it. And I didn't care for it when anyone else did it either. And it has died sufficiently. It hasn't even come back in like the, you know, fashion reinvention of the 80s. So I'm going to leave that RIP. Nice. Nice. Cat. Okay. Yes. My answer would be the Ugg boots, like mm, the regular slamming. lined ones, but with the mini skirt, because it just never <laughs> made sense to me. Are you hot or cold? So it was very distracting. <gasps> I love that. It's so true. Mine is w- when I was in college in the late 90s, it was very common and very trendy at my university to have like nail extensions that were like Mm. squared off and the favored color was sort of this brownish purple and every regardless of sort of skin tone or style or whether it was at all practical we just all had this thing and it was horrific and I'm really (laughs) glad that that eventually stopped. Oh my god. That that question could give and give. I mean, I it almost really, went I with mean, the Canadian tuxedo from... and sure. I did, yeah. So, anyway. I thought about the when we used to like braid one part of our hair and then grow yep. it really long and then cut the rest of our hair. Do you remember oh my that? God. So there was one really long braid with like a bead on the end. That was a thing. Anyway, we could do this all day, but we have important topics to discuss. Yeah, why don't you tee it up? Okay. So, Kat, you and I were introduced a little while back and then you very generously explained to me what epistemic injustice is and why it is not epistemic justice and also the etymology of all of this. So why don't you give our listeners the same sort of quick and dirty 101 intro to this sort of discipline that you gave me? Yeah, sounds good. Okay, so the first thing I'll give everyone a disclaimer that I'm (laughs) not a philosopher. I'm not even anything approaching a philosopher, but epistemic injustice is an area of study within philosophy, and an epistemic injustice occurs when you or someone has been wronged in their capacity as a knower, which kind of just is exactly what it sounds like. And I think probably the most popular example that we have today is Gaslighting, that's become part of our culture. We talk about that a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, So that is basically when someone is trying to convince you that you can't trust yourself because you're crazy. And it Mm -hmm. comes from the play and the movie Angel Street or, you know, Gaslight, whatever you 
whatever people are calling it, depending on whatever country you're in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is that a good overview? That's a great overview. And where did the term come from? Well, the number one question I get is why isn't it epistemic justice? Why is it epistemic injustice? And the reason that it's injustice is basically building on the work of this woman named Judith Schlar. And she said that basically you miss a lot if you're looking only for justice. So we believe in philosophy and in the world in general that justice is the default and then injustice is just kind of this anomalous thing that might occur sometimes. And Mm. in this field of study and I guess some others now, the idea is that you will miss much of the world, that justice isn't the default. And so we are well served to look at injustice. And I kind of think that has an interesting coherence with like safety science and Mm -hmm. things like that. So what that makes me wonder is how do I spot it? So like if I'm living my life and either contributing to it or observing it or experiencing it, are there cues to watch out for or turns of phrase or typical players or roles? Yeah, I think so. So first thing that is helpful in spotting it is being aware that it's a thing that exists, right? So now Mm -hmm. I have sensitized you to the fact that epistemic injustice does exist in the world and there are people who are wronged in their capacity as knowers. And it kind of comes in two flavors or there's two flavors that we talk about. And the first one is testimonial injustice. And this is where someone is wronged in their capacity as a giver of knowledge. So that's usually when there's something about that person, like some fundamental attribute about them that we think makes them less credible. So Mm. I'm a woman working in technology. And so there are a lot of people that assume that I will be less credible than my male counterparts. So that's an example of a testimonial injustice. And then the second bucket is hermeneutical injustice, which is so fun to say. (laughs) But that's when someone is wronged in their capacity as a subject of social understanding, which sounds fancy, but it's not really. It's basically when you are or people in your social group are not really part of the, the group that's creating the stories that we use to make sense of our world. So this Uh, is like the winners, right? The history books. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So when we have people that are hermeneutically marginalized, those folks are usually not participating in in creating the lexicon that we use to describe our world and creating the stories that we use to describe our world. And the things that you can pay attention to, I kind of think that there are a couple key phrases that if you know those, you'll be able to identify a lot more. Mm. So uh, for testimonial injustice, what I try to like plant in my head is if I hear myself or someone else saying something like, don't be hysterical, right? Mm. That's I'm committing an act of epistemic injustice there, right? Because I believe that there's something about them, right? Oh, well, you're just too emotional. That's causing me to discredit whatever testimony they're trying to give me. So I try to like really sensitize myself to things like that. Don't be whatever. And I use hysterical as my example. And then for hermeneutical injustice, when you are tempted to say things like that's unbelievable, that's usually a good example that whatever that person just said is not part of the way that you make sense of the world. Mm. So you usually have this reaction like, that's unbelievable. Did that really happen? Whatever. And that's a good indication that you are committing an act of hermeneutical injustice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so maybe just now that we know a little bit more about the flavors, can you talk a little bit about how those relate to gaslighting? Uh, Yeah, I (laughs) suppose. Yeah, there's, I don't know if you've seen the play or the movie or any of these things, but it's kind of probably a little bit of both, but probably more of a testimonial injustice. So 
it's a young woman who marries this man and they move into this house and she doesn't know anything about the house, but she knows she's not allowed to go in the attic because it's her husband's like super special private place or something. I don't know. It (laughs) really is dumb, but he goes to work (laughs) every day. He leaves for work. Bye, honey. See you when I get home. And he's gone for a couple of minutes. And then all the gas lighting in the house goes down Mm -hmm. with gas lighting. That's because you turned on another light, right? Like it's just, it's one feed of gas or whatever that's being split amongst all this lighting. And she's like, dude, every day when you leave for work, the lights go down like someone else is turning on a light. And I start hearing all this noise in the attic. What do you think is going on? Are there like really well-lit rats or something? And he's like, don't pay attention to it. Don't go in the attic. And (laughs) she just keeps saying, this is super weird. And he, you know, keeps trying to convince her with all these different things that she's crazy. And spoiler alert, at the end, she has someone who comes to her and says, hey, is there some weird stuff happening in your house? Because it seems like there might be. And she said, yes, finally, someone to believe me, there is some weird stuff. And it turns out that her husband is like crawling up in the attic to look for some murdered lady's jewels or something. So he's been the one turning on the light the whole time. And he's just like, hey, don't worry about it. But he uses a lot of kind of attacks on Mm -hmm. his wife that are are based on who she is being a young woman and he does all of these things like you're too emotional you're too high strung all of these things to try to convince her that she is crazy and she has these moments the the odd thing about epistemic injustice is that it is something that you can do to yourself right right like I can believe that I am less credible based on something about me, right? And so she does have moments where she doubts herself and where she's doing that to herself through the course of the play or movie or whatever version you're watching. And then once she gets someone who says to her, hey, I think your testimony has value and I believe you, then she's able to reaffirm her belief in herself and they catch her murdering jewel thief husband. <laughs> and so it's a happy it's story. It's a super weird it's play. A happy like story. I don't know how it became like part of our zeitgeist or whatever, but it is so yeah, it's weird. Quite and a no throwback. one's seen it. Yeah. It really yeah. has. And I suspect that the gas, the rise of gaslighting, this is based on absolutely nothing. So there's no research or okay, science great. to back up what I'm about to say, just to let everyone know. But I do feel like gaslighting is having a real moment in the zeitgeist. And I believe that it is related to Twitter. <laughs> Like, I think that because the discourse that is so obvious and patterned on social media platforms in general, but Twitter specifically, is very consistent, and it often goes to a place of, you must be crazy because, and other people starting to question, like, everything about their belief system because of the social pressure and strong opinions of those they've never met, I sort of suspect that part of the reason gaslighting has become in all of our lexicon, like day-to-day language is because so many of us are having the experience of it with strangers all the time. Yes. You think? Yes. Are you buying into my made-up yeah. theory? I'm totally buying into Sweet. it. Hook, line, and, and now sinker. we're three. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Right. So I am uh, not feeling gaslit in this moment, which is great. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's something, obviously, we know that social media platforms are designed to drive engagement, and it is interesting how low friction, I guess it is, on Twitter for folks to spin up new accounts or spin up bots. And then mm-hmm. the natural behavior that we as humans have is this one-upping thing, right? Yeah. It's like, I share something. And I'll share something that's one more than that, right? This is like the phishing stories that we exchange. And now you can use bots or a bot network on Twitter to do that one-upping 
right? And mm-hmm. so it naturally leads uh, to this really intense crystallization of viewpoints in really polarized direction. And I think it's natural to experience that as gaslighting. Yeah. Twitter is such a meta platform too that I'm thinking about like not that long ago in the last week or so, a white American former congressional candidate accidentally like shit posted something that he had meant to post through his sock puppet account in which he impersonates a black gay man. And from the lens of epistemic injustice, you're like, okay, wait a second, what's happening there? A white man is trying to say white man stuff through the mouth of someone who is generally, you know, the victim of this injustice. But to use that then as a lever on that community, it just was like such a mind fuck for me. So this is a timely episode for me putting the pieces together. Yeah, that's the really interesting thing right now. I mean, it's something that could have been done before, right? But now you can do it with just this great amount of ease where you, if you are epistemically privileged or epistemically centered, you can create narratives really easily that serve to further marginalize certain groups. So that is very interesting. And then we have the whole phenomenon of cancel culture, right? Mm -hmm. Which like if you are already marginalized, it's impossible for you to get canceled. You just (laughs) start from a place of canceled. Yeah. And then, but if you are operating from this place of immense privilege, then apparently you can fall victim to cancel culture, which I believe amounts to nothing because you will still be operating from a place of epistemic privilege. And so it seems almost impossible for you to actually become marginalized. Yeah. So where my mind is going, Kat, is we've talked on this show and most people are talking in the world right now about general systemic injustice. So just, you know, the fact that most of the systems that we are in and around, whether in our companies or in our governments or in our education or church systems are, are largely created by one group of people and designed for that same group of people to feel comfortable and thrive and survive and benefit and all of that stuff. And obviously that group of people is generally white men. How does that, how does the concept of like macro systemic injustice square with epistemic injustice? Yeah, they're all kind of the same thing or I guess inextricably linked, Uh I suppose. Yeah. I mean, I think trying to wrap your head around hermeneutical injustice is probably the most interesting thing to do on this topic, right? And for me, one of the most interesting examples we have in American history, at least, is Sojourner Truth, her famous speech, Ain't I a Woman?, Mm -hmm. where she goes through and says, okay, this is the narrative that we have about womanhood, but this is the narrative of my life. So are we going to make womanhood bigger so that it can encompass Mm. my experience of it? Or are we just going to kind of keep trekking along and deny people their lived experience? And it's not just that speech, right, but the way that she lived her life. One of the things that she did was she, after she became whatever, quote unquote, freed, she Mm -hmm. went and tried to get one of her children out of slavery to use the courts to. And this was just like not a thing that anyone had ever even really considered before because the institution of the courts didn't exist to serve her, right? And so I think there's a really interesting thing there where we have our concept of these institutions and that they are supposed to serve people with privilege, But if you are operating at the margins, Mm -hmm. perhaps there's an opportunity for you to exploit 
the fact that those institutions are just ideas that we all share, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, you can use it in whatever way you want, right? Like the courts don't actually exist. Yes, there are physical buildings and things like that, but like the law is not a physical object. It's an idea, a social contract, a social contract that all of us are bought into. And so I think there is a really interesting thing there, which we're kind of seeing the downside of right now, where we have all of these norms and all of these I don't know, just concepts, right? And if you are at the margins, you can say, well, I choose to believe that this is going to serve me in this way, or I choose to believe that I can use this thing. I don't know. It's just really interesting, right? Mm -hmm. Like it could be that you choose to believe the things about yourself that the prevailing system of power says about you. But if you choose not to believe those things and to believe yourself and trust your own testimony and your own experience, does that give you an advantage, a way to exploit whatever the existing power structure is? Just Mm. really interesting. The other really interesting thing about Sojourner Truth, like Aaron, you said something about, you know, history is written by the victors or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. But all the evidence suggests that she would have spoken very differently because she was raised in a Dutch community. And afterwards, the people that recorded her testimony chose to record it in a way to suggest that she was like your classic Southerner, right? Mm. Ain't I a woman? Even though she probably wouldn't have spoken that way at all, right? So mm. we can continually re-know things if that makes any sense at all, which I'm not sure that it does, right? But like knowing is a continuous act. Yes, we learn something, but we have to keep choosing to believe in that thing, right? So we learn about these power structures, but every day we are choosing to believe in them or not. And what we're going through right now in various places in the world is that we're being conspicuously confronted with that choice. Do we choose to keep believing in this structure or not? Because there are other people that are not believing in it or believing Mm -hmm. that it operates in some other way. And so we're having this like fracturing of the fundamental concepts of our society. A general epistemic crisis. (laughs) It's like much bigger than... Just yeah. justice and injustice, yeah. And I, Aaron, I know you want to talk about how this relates to work. Kat, the example that you just gave or sort of the, the arc that you just laid out reminded me of a client, actually, that I worked with a number of years ago. And it was a fairly small, like, physical site that everyone worked at. And there were these very strong and not particularly helpful or empathic or human like cultural norms and trappings of working in this place. And there was this group of people who worked on a different shift than like the regular sort of nine to five shift. And because of referrals and networks and the demographic of the local area, most of these people were non-white people who spoke the same language that was not English. And I mention this because When we were early in the engagement and we were sort of doing some discovery and starting to understand like what was up in this system, there was this group of people that behaved very differently than everyone else. And their whole experience of working in this place was radically different and radically better than what was typical and what was normal. And so when you were talking about sort of like what the prevailing structure is, what the prevailing culture and the prevailing norms are, it just made me think about like, in this particular example, there was this group that was sort of like a splinter group whose own prevailing norms and culture was stronger than the sort of like jacked up corporate way of being and doing things and managed to maintain that even within this larger system. And though they were not like persecuted or shunned for doing that, they were anomalous to the point that everyone else in the organization was sort of like, what is up with them? Like they're always like happy and Those doing weirdos. these potlucks, like seem to enjoy each other's company. And and ultimately, how can we be more like that? But it was just an it was an interesting example of all of these things sort of existing under one roof, but looking very different in terms of what was true. 
yeah, I wish that we could do more of that, right? Like that's sort of an extreme example when you have someone, you know, there's the separation in time and place and with the language. But I think everyone right now, we're in the midst of all this digital transformation and all of these things. And people, as they start to explore what is the potential value of that, I see many of them going to the folks who are well served by the existing system. Mm -hmm. And they ask those folks, what's the value in digital transformation or what's the value in this or what's the value in that? Well, of course, those folks are going to map what they already know about the value of their system onto whatever the new thing is, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So if you want to understand the potential of a new system or a new way of operating, I think that you have to go to the margins, to the people that are not served by the current system, because that's where the potential is for innovation and growth. It's just very interesting to me when I see people saying that they're excited about something different, but they're going to ask people for more of the same, right? In my head, I just saw the word cryptocurrency. Yes, I know. (laughs) This is just... (laughs) I don't know if you know this about me, but it's like one of the things I could rant about for a very long, long time, right? Like we are taking the same extractive paradigm that we've been living in for a very long time, not very long in human history, but you know what I mean, right? And we are mapping that on to an entirely digital ecosystem. So we are taking the scarcity that is inherent in a system that is based on like physical Fiat currency goods yeah. and, and occupying physical space. And we're now mapping that same paradigm and that same way of operating onto a digital space that is potentially unbounded, right? Like, so why would we try to map an extractive paradigm onto something that is so much more valuable with a generative mindset, right? Like data has value when you move it around and when you use it. It's something that has value based on how much it is used. And we are instead mapping this extractive paradigm onto it, which basically says what has value? The things that you hoard. I'm like, that (laughs) is literally the opposite. I don't know if you uh, know our former guest Douglas Rushkoff, but he he would have a good a good time up on that soapbox with you. <laughs> it's just redonkulous. So I want to dig a little deeper into the work thing that Rodney started, which is you know I, just looking at these two concepts, testimonial and hermeneutical injustice. I feel like these probably show up at work a lot, and so maybe just generally speaking, can you talk about how you think they do? show up and what, you know, what does that look like? And maybe even we can start to get into a little bit of what to do about it. Yeah, certainly. We see them kind of overlapping in a lot of ways too. So what are the stories that we have about success in industry, right? Those are all created, you know, largely by white dudes. So then we have people who are suffering testimonial injustice and they're women and uh, people of color, people who didn't go to a fancy school, all of these different attributes, I guess, that would cause people to perceive something negative about someone's credibility. So we marginalize them in that way. And then we also, even when they are successful, we treat it as an anomaly and and don't allow that success to begin to shape new narratives about what success looks like. Mm. And I don't know how much shit I'm allowed to talk, but if anyone has been watching, (laughs) if anyone has been watching what's going on with Bridgewater in the news, right? Like that is an extremely interesting example where we have an old white dude who knows that there's no other dude that can fill his spot. So he picks two other white dudes. And then finally it ends up being a woman that comes in and kind of 
cleans up and treat her like dirt and she leaves. Right. And it's just that success, right? Everyone is so anxious, like, oh, we have to have some other way to explain this. We can't explain it by just this woman spent a long time in that industry is really good at her job, Mm well-regarded, deserving of success, right? And then, Mm. you know, you have other women that are coming forward saying they're being paid less than their peers and that kind of stuff. Like, that is it, right? Where we see like the actual results of someone's actions are completely divorced from the credibility that we ascribe to them. Mm -hmm. And like that, that makes me think about the, just the example of being college educated. Like Mm -hmm. I feel like being, Mm -hmm. having an undergraduate degree was your ticket to industry up until a few white dudes were really successful without it. And now it's like a badge of honor. But when when previously people who didn't have access for all of the reasons to college education were just as smart and just as talented and just as all of the things didn't have that ticket, they were not given admission. And now it's like, oh, because this one group has said that that is a, it, a reasonable exception, it is. But still probably mostly only for that group. Well, I was going to say, right. yeah, I still like it's still, res- it's still reserved. That exception is still like part of the story of the white culture. That, it's that still cute on white tech bros. Work. It's less yeah. cute on everyone else. Yeah, of course. I see that so much, right? I have tons of friends that have to go through this really rigorous process for interviews and doing a lot of intense software engineering interviews and then their male counterparts, they ask them like, oh, wow, how was that coding interview? And they say, I didn't have to do a coding interview. So it is not a requirement. Things like that, going to a fancy school or or being able to do whatever those dumb challenges are. <laughs> how many ping pong uh, balls fit in a Greyhound bus? Right, exactly. What kind of rock do you throw in an interview? I don't know. The kind that takes out the interviewer? Things. Yeah. <laughs> They're not required for people that are operating from that place of privilege. The one thing that I do find interesting in that space of hiring, right, is that now with the position that we're in where it's more and more difficult to hire someone to work in the U.S., someone who's from another country, right, not a citizen or doesn't have a work permit or whatever, you're basically trying to get them a visa. Now, what I've seen is a lot of companies have this like degree requirement or something like that, that they're actually pretty strict on because it kind of paves the way for them to have folks working on a visa. So it is interesting how some of those things kind of work their way into our regulations and laws. But then you you have Google answering that, right? And saying like, oh, well, we're just going to have our own separate certification process or something like that to decide if you're a competent technical worker. Interesting. It is, you know, and it's a different kind of work too, but it makes me think about creative industries. Like particularly I'm thinking about hermeneutical injustice in the whole like Oscar's so white movement, Mm. right? Like who's writing the stories? Who's telling the stories? Yeah, Uh, right. What is a good piece of art, right? Right. And so you can go by like what is compelling for your fellow humans when they witness that. But there's probably some rubric that's being used that is designed to further marginalize folks that haven't participated in creating that rubric, right? So it's just like Mm -hmm. a vicious cycle. And that goes back to what we were talking about with social media, where now it's much easier for that polarization to happen in a very short time frame. If you like what you're hearing today and in general, a review would mean so much to us or even better, forward our show to someone who needs it. And this week, we're going to try something special. We're going to choose one reviewer who drops a, a hot review on the app uh, on the Apple uh, Podcast Store. And we're going to give away a 30-minute consult with, with Rodney and myself, yours truly, and my partner in crime. So if you would like to spend 30 minutes with us shooting the shit or solving a problem, drop a review, and one lucky winner will be picked next week. So Kat, now that we've mapped out the territory a bit of how this type of injustice exists 
insights in systems. What should companies be doing with this kind of information? Okay, so the first thing, it's obviously important because if you're looking for innovation, then I think you you need to go to the epistemic margins in order to find that, right? You have to find people that know how the current way is not serving them because that's where the opportunity is. So then... If you find those people, you have to find a way to get what's in their head out of their head externalized. And you have to find a way to help people appreciate the value of that testimony. So there are a few little things that I think each of us individual humans can do that can help ourselves and help the other humans that we work with kind of be better, striving more towards epistemic justice and Mm -hmm. being conscious of epistemic injustice. So the first thing, when you are entering into a conversation, whether it's a meeting or you're making a new Slack channel or whatever the case may be, whatever forum where people may exchange testimony, I think it's really helpful, even though it's a very simple thing to just mention why each person is there. Mm. So I'll give you an example of when this did not go very well. I was in a meeting a few years ago with some software vendor-y people and we, there were a bunch of us gathered and we had invited the staff engineer who would be the one to kind of say if this product was actually fulfilling the requirements and fulfilling the business case, the reason we were looking to buy it. And we, all of us on the buyer side, we knew that she would be the one to decide if the thing was worth paying for because she was the subject matter expert and she Mm -hmm. could actually verify Mm -hmm technically, that it was a thing worth paying for. But we did not mention that to the folks on the other side of the table. And they spent the entire time just interrogating all the other dudes in the room. They don't say anything to me and they don't say anything to her. And then with about five minutes left in the meeting, one of the architects said, don't you think that you should ask a question of the person who will decide if you get paid or not? And you could just see all of these guys in their beautiful, Mm. freshly pressed blue suits, like (laughs) sink into their chairs. So Mm -hmm. sad. (laughs) Yeah. So that was a failing on our part, right? That we didn't communicate why each of us was in the room. Right. And then it was a failing on their part that they assumed that the men in the room would be the decision makers and kind of hold the per- the purse strings. So if you can just say like so and so is here because they have experience with this or they are the person that understands this or that or whatever the case may be, right? But mm-hmm. just just framing up in context why the different people have credibility, right? So then we become sensitized more so to how our biases might be causing us to interpret credible testimony as not so credible. So Mm -hmm. the first thing is just to frame up, like, why are the people who are here here. And then it can open a door for those folks that might be really accustomed to being marginalized, may open a door to help them share their experience, right? Because that is a skill. Being able to share your testimony is a skill. And if you're not provided with that opportunity very frequently, you might just not be good at it, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. The second thing is just Instead of, and I know in the age of like Nassim Taleb and like Robin Hansen and all of these wannabe pseudo intellectual tool bags, it's very difficult. But if we can just create a space 
where multiple things can be true at the same time. Mm. So I can say something that is true and you also can say something that is true, right? Like very frequently, it's not that one thing is true and the other thing is false. It's that we need to create a bigger space where there can be more than one thing that is true. So the question that I always ask myself when I hear someone say something and I have that reaction of, oh my God, that's unbelievable, right? I catch myself realizing that that's probably a hermeneutical injustice. Mm. And I ask myself, what would it take for that to be true? Mm. And then if I can use my own skills at storytelling to come up with a story that would make whatever outlandish thing that was said true, then that's good, right? Like even if ultimately I decide that that testimony isn't credible, it's a really good exercise in empathy, right? Mm -hmm. So even if I decide that that person is full of shit, I still have engaged in the practice of empathy. And Mm -hmm. no matter what, I've moved us in the right direction. So that's the second thing, just asking what would it take? I love that. It's like a much more, pra- I'm not practical, but it is like a more practical version of perspective taking. Because mm-hmm. it's like, you can't really take someone else's perspective, especially someone who is not like you, because you can't like see out of their eyes and share their lived yeah. experience. So I like the idea, but like anyone, because humans are great sense makers and storytellers, anyone can do the work of saying, what would it take for that to be true? Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's, it helps that's you. Yeah, it helps you build the world in which that other person is living, right? Rather than just trying to understand their testimony from scratch. So Mm -hmm. I found that to be helpful. And then the last thing is extremely stupid, but extremely (laughs) helpful. I've given myself a trigger and I got this from the book, Researching Your Own Practice. It's I think it's by John Mason. So he says you should give yourself a trigger for kind of evaluating whatever conversation or exchange you just had. So for me, my trigger is when I walk through a door, I drink a lot of water Mm. and I only ever will drink out of a glass that is 16 ounces or less because that will cause me to get up and move around because I drink a lot of water. So it doesn't take me that long to drink 16 ounces of water. So I walk through a door or multiple doors even, very frequently. And when I walk through the door, I just try to think about whatever exchange I just had and ask myself, like, was I being kind of a good epistemic citizen in that exchange? Was I having respect for the other person's testimony and whatever the case may be? And usually walking through a door, like, not a huge amount of time has passed since I just had mm-hmm. that exchange. So right, if I right. walk through the door, evaluate the exchange I just had and realize that I was a total douche kebab, then I can go back and say, Hey, you know what? Can we relive that really quick? Because I'm pretty sure I dismissed you in a way that wasn't very helpful. Or sometimes I'm saying it about myself, right? Like, Hey, I want to rewind to that conversation because I, I don't think I impressed upon you how critical whatever I was trying to convince you of was, right? I think that we should work really hard to train ourselves to kind of trust our internal model of our position in the world, right? Because when we hear something that gives us a feeling, right? So even if you're someone who's operating from a privileged space and you hear some testimony and you find it compelling, even though you think that person shouldn't be able to give compelling testimony, you'll Mm. get like this little hint of cognitive dissonance in your head. And I think if we all paid attention to that, right? Uh, Like a little bit of our intuition or feelings and how they kind of bubble up and go away and trust our own lived experience and trust the lived experience of other people, the world would be a better place. And I think part of how we can do that is 
just by making notes to ourselves, like this happened and I got a weird feeling. Mm. When we reflect on that, we're training our internal model of who is credible, who's not, what kind of stories should I be listening to? And so I think that that is potentially really powerful and transformative. And it could give you the opportunity to say to someone to be that person, like from the movie Gaslight, right? Where someone goes to her and says, Hey, I believe you. And if we, if each one of us could be that person for one other human in the world, imagine how transformative that would be. That's awesome. And by saying make the world a better place, we have completed Brave New Work Bingo. Um, And for that reason, I'm going to draw things to a close. Kat, where can our listeners find out more about you and your work? I don't know. Twitter. I pretty much live on Twitter. Let's do that. Kat Swatel. At Kat Swatel. We'll put it in the show notes. Kat, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. And as always, we're going to do a quick tip of the hat to Taylor Marvin for making us all sound good. Brave New Work is produced by The Ready, where we help organizations around the world change the way they work. Get in touch with us by emailing podcast at theready.com. And as for you, thanks for listening. Now go change something.